Father, again, we thank you that you've gathered us together here today. And Lord, we want to hear from you. Lord, we want to hear from you through this passage today. It's a familiar passage. We've read the story many times. Lord, we want to hear from you deeply today from this passage in John. So speak to us. And as always, we invite the power of the Holy Spirit to be present with us because we know that as the Holy Spirit is with us, there can be no spirit of distraction in the room. And as the Holy Spirit is with us, there can be no spirit of doubt or confusion in the room. Only the Holy Spirit may speak and move and have his way. And Holy Spirit, we do long for you to do just that. Come and have your way in this place today. Amen. Amen. Well, the last two weeks, uh, I have been talking about the mission of God or the Missio Dei. We defined what the mission of God was and what Missio Dei is and how that involves us. We also looked at the Great Commission from Matthew 28 and tied that into the mission of God. Today I want to look at this passage in John 4 and continue along this line of the mission of God. So as I'm looking at John 4 today, I'm really looking at it with an eye toward the mission of God, okay? So let's start reading. It's a long passage. It's 39 verses. Fasten your seatbelts. All right. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judah and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria <coughs> called Zachar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back here to draw water. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. And a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus <coughs> declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman, but no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her, her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? <laughs> My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four more months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and a harvest and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. 
Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I say to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. It's a long passage. All right, going back to verses 3 and 4 to start. <coughs> So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. And then verse 4, now he had to go through Samaria. So Jesus leaves Judea and heads back to Galilee. So John is just sort of laying out his travel plans here. But the reason he's traveling is to get away from the Pharisees who thought that he was gaining more popularity than John the Baptist. Isn't that hilarious? In the Pharisees' mind, this was a popularity contest. And they thought if Jesus becomes more popular, it's a threat to us, so we better eliminate him. So that's why Jesus starts out on this journey, is because the Pharisees saw it as a popularity contest. But what's interesting in verse 4, it says that he travels through Samaria. Now, as you recall, the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. That's the whole point behind Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan, right? A good Jew would do everything possible to avoid traveling through Samaria. There was a much longer route that went around Samaria, and they would always take the longer route versus going through Samaria. But as we have seen throughout this miniseries on the mission of God, Jesus is for all nations. So Jesus had no troubles traveling through Samaria. You see, the mission of God is not afraid to go, others, to go where others will not. Verse 6. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Now, some translations, if you're looking at some of the older translations in your Bible, it might say, uh, the sixth hour. Correct. Thank you. I had a little mind plank there, but thank you. The sixth hour means noon, and this is an important detail. But Jesus, tired as he was, despite his human frailty, he maintains a kingdom perspective here in this moment. Verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Now, there's a couple things we need to note here. This woman appears to be alone, and this was not normally the custom, okay? Women would have come in groups for protection and socialization. They also wouldn't have come at the sixth hour or noon during the heat of the day. They would have come early in the day or late in the day to avoid the heat. Typically, they would come early in the morning to gather the water needs for the day and to avoid the heat, right? So this woman seems to want to go without notice, and this is probably because of what we'll learn about her later and her shameful reputation. But now Jesus starts a dialogue with her, someone that the religious establishment of the day would not have even given the time of day to, okay? She was a Samaritan, she was a woman, she was an uneducated commoner. Some of the Pharisees wouldn't even have acknowledged her presence there at the well. But Jesus starts a conversation with her because the mission of God is not afraid to go where others will not. Jesus also is very clever with how he starts the conversation. They're standing near a well, so he talks about water. But he also knows that from this starting point of water, he can steer the conversation toward the kingdom. Right? God is always on mission, and he's always looking to steer toward the kingdom. I used to be super involved with the Chamber of Commerce here in Crystal Lake, and I'd go to all their mixers and all their meetings. I really perfected this art, if you will. I could steer a conversation toward the spiritual in 30 seconds. It didn't matter what they said. I would let them speak first, and I would take what they said, and I would steer it right back to the kingdom. I could do it in 30 seconds every time. That's what Jesus is doing here. He knows that by talking about water, the sitting next to water, he can get this woman where she needs to be, right? Now, a few weeks ago, we had looked at this verse, and it's way at the end of our section today. Verse 35 says, Don't you have a saying, it's still four more months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Jesus' eyes were open to see that this woman was ready for the kingdom. Okay? Verse 8. 
a parenthetical statement. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. This is a really important thing. It's a parenthetical statement, but it explains first why Jesus is alone at the well. But keep in mind, there's no way a good Jew would have bought food in a Samaritan territory. It's not going to happen. Jews are not going to buy food in a Samaritan territory. But the mission of God is not afraid to go where others will not. You know, I have an interesting little story. Amy and I had a similar experience to this. Last year when we were in Mozambique, we had traveled 300-some kilometers to go to the small town to visit this particular church in the small town. And we had to stay in this really small, old, rundown motel. <laughs> it became clear that the motel was not for tourists or travelers. <laughs> And in the morning, the motel did not have breakfast, but the innkeeper told us that right up the road a little bit, there was a restaurant that served breakfast. So we went there. We go inside, and Zvimi goes up to order. We sit down, and I'm looking around the room, and I realize we are in an all-Muslim halal restaurant. We're the only white people in there. We're the only non-Muslims in there, and it's a halal restaurant. You know how <coughs> Jews have their kosher food? Muslims have halal food. It's like kind of their version of that. Like it's very specific kind of food and prepared in a certain way and prayed over. So we're in an all-Muslim halal restaurant. I'm like, well, this is pretty cool. Kingdom of God came here, huh? Verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. The woman brings up their issue of cultural differences. She probably fears the worst and doesn't want anything to do with a Jew. She's probably trying to brush Jesus off because she's had such bad experiences with Jews, okay? But the mission of God is not afraid to go where others will not. And so Jesus is not troubled by this statement. Jesus doesn't get offended. He doesn't bite on her brush off. Verse 10. <laughs> Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus largely skirts her question or comment about us not getting along and he shouldn't be talking to her, and he goes to this kingdom analogy of water. He does this in a way to really spark her interest, but notice that he does not argue with her or go into some sort of apologetic for Judaism. Now, this comment about water is significant in a number of ways. First of all, this was a very arid region, and they always desperately needed water. This well was generations old, all the way back to Jacob. And they treasured this well because it was life. Without this well, there's no life for them there, okay? And they understand that. Jesus could also be referring to Jeremiah 2, 3 that says, My people committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the living water, and they have dug their own cisterns that cannot hold water. But in a nutshell, he is speaking both to her physical need as well as her spiritual need using the reference of this water in this well that's right there. Okay, Verse 11. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw water with. The well is deep. Where can you get this living water? The woman's response is toward the physical. She sees no spiritual significance to what Jesus said. I'm going to come back to that in a minute because that's important. Verse 12. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Now she starts to get a little bit of argument, like the first statement, are you greater than our father Jacob? She's getting a little bit argumentative and defensive and appeals to their religious tradition. The irony, of course, is that Jesus is greater than Jacob, right? Mm -hmm. She doesn't understand who she's talking to yet. Now, sometimes when we direct a conversation toward the spiritual and the kingdom, people may respond strangely. Don't engage or argue with that. Just let it be, all right? Because the mission of God is not afraid to go where others will not. Verses 13 and 14. <clears throat> Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus now begins to compare the physical with the spiritual, right? 
we can begin to do this in our own conversations. As we think about being on mission with God, we can think about how we can make these kinds of analogies. Point out the temporal nature of the physical things. Water, food, money, power, sex only last for a short time. Help them see the need for something more permanent and lasting, like living water that will well up with inside of us. We don't need to go to a physical well. The well will be in us. Right? That's what the job of the Holy Spirit was. In the old day, to get close to God, you had to go to a geographic location with the Holy Spirit. God is in us. Here, living water is in us. We don't have to go to a geographic location to find that physical water. Verse 15. <clears throat> the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back to draw water. The woman now responds a little bit more favorably. She's still missing the point and thinking only in terms of the physical need for water. And it's probably more that she doesn't want to keep coming back to this well in the middle of the day by herself, right? She's having to come out here at noon. No other women will come with her. That's probably what she's thinking. But here's the point I want to make with this. In this moment, her physical need and pain are preventing her from seeing the need for a spiritual solution. In this moment, her physical need and her pain are preventing her from seeing the need for a spiritual solution. You see, the physical pain is so great that it can often blind someone to their need for a spiritual solution. Here's the thing. Spiritual solutions to physical pain confuse people. I talk to people every single day that have some sort of physical problem, a problem in the physical realm, finances, relationships, whatever it might be, and the solution is spiritual, and that confuses them. They don't understand that. I'm going to attempt to tackle that next week, but that'll be a challenge. Our need, our physical needs, and our pain prevent us from seeing that, our, that what we really need is a spiritual solution, right? Verse 16. Now it starts to get good. He told her, go, go call your husband and come back. Jesus now turns to the supernatural. He has earned just enough trust with this woman. He's going to turn things up a little bit. This is great. As we're on mission with God, you're sort of building trust. You're steering the conversation to a spiritual way, and then you begin to build trust so that you can kind of ramp it up a little bit. All right? You can't start out there because you'll just turn them off right away. But the real issue is the one that Jesus wants to get at. He sees her pain from the failed relationships, and that's what he wants to get at, okay? Jesus is talking to this woman at the well, and he makes this comment, go call your husband. He sees her physical and emotional pain. That's what he wants to get at. That's what he wants to touch and heal. He's all about the kingdom, but he's going to get there by addressing her emotional pain. Because the mission of God will go where others are afraid to go. We may come across people who are in this kind of emotional pain, and that's the doorway. That's the entry point to the kingdom. But most people are like, yeah, I don't want to deal with that. See ya. <coughs> but those kinds of things, and it, we're not solving their emotional pain. We're inviting Jesus to solve the emotional pain, right? <coughs> that's the doorway to the kingdom. Verse 17. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. I would love to have been sitting at this conversation, wouldn't you? The woman tells Jesus what he already knows. Right? He already knew that. That's why he brought it up. Verse 18. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Jesus uses a word of knowledge to make a statement about her husband. In the vineyard, we sometimes refer to this as reading your mail. Scripture would call this a word of knowledge, and I will cover that in my class starting on Saturday. Don't miss it. <laughs> There's that same endorsement. Jesus now not only has the woman's interest, but her full attention, both physically and spiritually. He has gone right to the heart of her issues, right to the heart of her pain. Presumably right to the reason she is at the well in the middle of the day. Notice Jesus is also blunt and to the point, but not condemning or judgmental. He just states a fact. You've had five husbands, and the man you're with now is not your husband. Just stating facts. Jesus wants to deal with her emotional pain more than we will ever know. 
This is good news for us today. There are people in this room in the same situation. You've told me that. It's not prophetic. There are people in this room that have told me they are in these kinds of relational situations, abandoned, neglected, abused by someone that should love you and protect you. Jesus is interested in healing that pain. He's more interested in healing her pain than anything else. That's his sole focus here. Here's the thing. In this day and age of Jesus, at the time this story is taking place, only the husband could initiate divorce. A woman could not. So this woman has been abandoned five times. Can you imagine the emotional pain and rejection? And again, if this resonates with you, there is healing in this. And we're going to minister healing later today. Jesus knows the only way to heal this pain is with the kingdom and the living water that he is offering. So he used her emotional pain as the entry point for the kingdom of God because the mission of God isn't afraid to go where others will not. Verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. According to her tradition and what she now understands, she's beginning to realize that this guy is something a little special. He's not just an ordinary Jew out here. Verse 20. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. The woman suddenly changes the subject. Now this is all about worship, and normally I preach this section about worship. But I want to stay focused on this idea of the mission of God, okay? She changes the subject. Jesus just called her out and said, you've had five husbands, the man you're with is now with, is not your husband. And she changes the subject. Where, where should we worship? It's really abrupt in in the narrative, right? Now, there are two theories that are both believable as to why she changed the subject. First, she changes the subject as a means to avoid her pain. It's easier to talk about theology than it is to face your deepest fears and pain, right? Now, if you're following on the outline in the bulletin, the outline ends here because we're at 39 verses. That's hard to put on one page. Now, the second option that some commentators suggest is she's trying to show off the knowledge that she does have. She's an uneducated Samaritan woman. This guy is, she's now called him a prophet. And so she tries to bring up this point about worship to try to show off the knowledge that she does have. Like, I'm not a complete idiot. I know this difference between where we should worship, right? Here's the thing, though. I don't think a hurting person is going to jump on the opportunity to ask a theological question. A hurting person is going to try to cover up pain by changing the subject. Right? She's hurting, and so she changed the subject because she didn't want to feel that pain. This will happen to us as we begin to engage in the mission of God, and as we begin to talk to people, they will quickly change the subject because we've touched a nerve. We've touched a source of pain for them. I, I would say it happens 90% of the spiritual conversations I have on the street. They will quickly change the subject. When I do, I'm like, oh, oh, okay. What was the last thing I said because that touched a nerve? Let's go there. And then you ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in how you can go there in a way that will be effective. Trust in these conversations. Trust that God is working and don't argue and don't allow the distraction to take you too far off course. Right? All right, verses 21 to 24. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship Father, the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Normally I would preach that on the fact that we're supposed to worship in spirit, but I want to stay on the mission of God. Jesus here finds common ground. It's important to know where you worship. It's not as important to know where we worship as to know who we worship, right? So he avoids this kind of argument or debate. And rather than getting into the nitty-gritty with her where we're supposed to worship, he talks about who we're supposed to worship and how in spirit, right? But he's trying to find common ground with her to stay focused on bringing it back to where she needs to be 
to get the healing for this emotional pain she is suffering from, okay? Verse 25. The woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. She doesn't fully understand who Jesus is yet, but what's interesting is a Samaritan, she does have a paradigm for the Messiah. Verse 26. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Jesus makes a bold declaration. Now remember, the reason Jesus is here is he is fleeing the persecution from the Pharisees, right? He's running away from the Pharisees, and now he's in enemy territory. He's in Samaria, and he declares, I am the Messiah. He just drew a massive target on himself. He's already fleeing persecution, and he fled into enemy territory, and then declares that he's the Messiah. <coughs> if anybody else, else around him heard that, they were picking up stones. But the mission of God is not afraid to go where others will not. Have I mentioned that? Verse 27. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Many scholars believe that the disciples' silence was because this was a woman, right? According to their tradition, Jesus should not be talking to this person, so they're afraid to ask why. But the mission of God is not afraid to go where others will not. The disciples missed the fact that the woman was ready for the kingdom. They didn't have their eyes open. Verse 28. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, apparently in her haste to tell everyone else about Jesus, she leaves behind her water jar. That was the whole reason she was out there at the well in the middle of the day by herself. Now, there well may be some symbolism here that she left the physical water to go tell everyone about the spiritual water that she's finding. This is interesting. Uh, commentator D.A. Carson says this, What is even more striking is her eagerness to bear witness before the townspeople whom she previously had reason to avoid. A minute ago, she's avoiding all the townspeople by going to the well by herself. <laughs> now she leaves her water and runs back to those same townspeople to tell them about Jesus. Because the mission of God is not afraid to go where others will not. <laughs> this is also what we call the disciple principle. The best evangelist is the most recent believer. <laughs> the best evangelist is the most recent believer because they haven't gotten all mucked up with other stuff that's not relevant. She knows nothing about Jesus yet, really, and yet she is eager to tell everyone about him. Verse 29. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Now, we don't know if this is exaggeration or if Jesus revealed more about her life that's simply not recorded, but she says, a man that told me everything I ever did. The point is, Jesus got through to her with the word of knowledge, and now she's excited. Notice her question, could this be the Messiah? She's not sure yet. She didn't have all the answers, but yet she could run and invite others and tell them about Jesus. Yeah. So often we don't do evangelism. We think, well, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have all the answers. I'm not a pastor. I didn't go to Bible school. This woman doesn't even know who Jesus is yet. And she leaves her water and runs back to the people she's been avoiding to tell them about Jesus. If she can do that, everybody in this room can do that. Yeah. And everybody online can do that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Verse 30. They came out of the town and made their way toward him. She apparently made quite an impression among the people that she had been previously scorned by. Much of the town comes out still during the heat of the day to see a stranger and a Jew at that. You just don't understand, like, this wasn't going to happen. They're not going to get up out of their houses in the cool places where they were sheltered in the day and go out into the heat to meet a Jew. They just weren't. So this woman made quite an impression. 
I'm going to jump to verses 31, 32. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Jesus is saying that even though I am tired, even though I'm hungry and thirsty, I find my strength in the Father, which stands in contrast to the need for actual food and water at this well. So they're still at the well, and they're begging him to eat and drink something. He's like, I don't need this because I have the Father, and I'm doing the will of the Father, right? Verse 34. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Maybe our food should be to do the will of the Father and not just seek our own comfort. Verse 35. We looked at this earlier. Don't you have a saying, it's still four more months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. I talked about that last week, but harvest means something that's already ripe. You don't harvest something before it's ready. So it means it's ready. And Jesus is saying there's always people ready. Always. Open your eyes and see the people that are ready. They're all around you, everywhere. People say, well, I don't do evangelism. I don't know anyone who's not a Christian. Open your eyes. Just open your eyes, look around. You will see somebody who's not a Christian. The word of God guarantees it. Verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him, because of the woman's testimony, he told me everything I ever did. Again, this is the discipleship principle. One turns to many. This woman was not sure if Jesus was Messiah, and yet her testimony causes many to believe. You don't have to have all the answers. You just have to be willing to take the mission of God where others will not. Yeah. And so all of that is a big plug to join Hannah and Memo as they start mm-hmm. Havana, as they start outreach and evangelism events. All right? I want to head into a little bit of ministry time. I'll invite the worship team to come on up.